Have you ever wondered what it would be like to sit down and have a conversation about fatherhood with best-selling author John Eldridge? Well, I got that opportunity, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about that experience, and we're going to show you the unedited, unplugged video of that interview coming up. Hey, it's John Finch with The Father Effect. I made a movie and wrote a book called The Father Effect, and I've interviewed hundreds of men and women. My goal for this channel is to help men and women both find hope and healing from their father wounds and to help men become the fathers God created them to be. Before we jump into today's video, if you're new to the channel, please hit that subscribe button. And don't forget to check out the Father Effect free 60-minute movie at the link in the upper right-hand corner. I've also included a few links to some of John Eldridge's books in the description. I sat down with John Eldridge as I was making the Father Effect movie. When I first set up the interview, his assistant said we would have about an hour with him. John actually sat with me for about two hours. He is an incredible guy who has amazing insights and knowledge about all things men and fathers. In this interview, John Eldridge talks at length about the father wound. He talks about the generational issues like fear, anger, abandonment, unworthiness, rejection, and how, if we're not careful, we can be passing those down to our kids. He talks about how to be a good dad to a son and a daughter, how to be a good husband. The real issue with addiction and how we overcome it. And he talks about so much more. For those of you who are familiar with John Eldridge and his book, Wild at Heart, after watching this video, I think you're gonna become even a bigger fan. And for those of you who are not familiar with John Eldridge, this video might just be the one that changes your life and legacy as a dad. Without further ado, here is my unedited, unplugged interview with best-selling author, John Eldridge. And we're recording for clip one, whenever you're ready. Okay, so what is the definition, what is your definition of a father wound? First you have to understand what little boys need. <clears throat> Every little boy growing up has two essential needs from his dad. He needs to know that his dad adores him. He needs to know, I love you. That's core, that comes first. That's the base for everything else. That's the foundation that everything else in the boy's life is built on. I love you, I am the apple of my dad's eye. He needs to know that, and he needs to know from his father, son, you have what it takes. See, that's, a little, that's the question every little boy has. Do I have what it takes? Will I be a man, right? Can I come through? And so through the story of his life, through the, the tender years, the teenage years, on into young manhood, every man craves this. These two things, love, and validation, okay? Delight from the Father and affirmation. You, you, you gotta get that. And, and so here's where the father wound comes in. The power of a father to bestow identity is extraordinary. It, it is, the father-son relationship is the most powerful relationship on the earth because in the story that we live in, the father-son relationship is the most powerful relationship in the universe because there is a father and there is a son, okay? So this is where the wounding comes in. If that little boy does not get from his father, you are my delight. If he gets something much worse than that, he may get silence, he may get abandonment, he might get violence. If he does not hear from his father, you have what it takes. Again, if he just gets silence, or if he gets something worse, you know, you are a little, you know, blankety blank and all of that, right? That's where the father wound comes in, okay? In those two places, in love and validation, delight and affirmation. If the boy gets wounded there from his father, it will define him for the rest of his life until he deals with it. Hey, if you find value in this video, please hit that like button and please subscribe to our channel. That way, every time we come out with a new video, you'll get notified. I greatly appreciate you. As a follow-up to that question, <clears throat> why do you think it's so difficult, man, to get to that point and dealing with it? 
every man is terrified that he's not what he ought to be. And so we fake it, right? I mean, you want to understand men, all you need to understand is what happened back in the Garden of Eden with Adam and his father, where Adam blows it and he goes into hiding and his father comes looking for him. And Adam says this, I was afraid because I was naked and so I hid. You understand that? You will understand every man in your world. Every man carries now this uncertainty in him that he has what it takes, right? That he can come through, that he's a real man. And so we fake it and we find some strength that we can lock on to. If you're smart, you know, you go there and you're the smart kid in school and then you go on to become, you know, the smart guy in the company. If you're athletic, you go there and so you get your validation there. See what I mean? If you're good looking, you know, you go to the girls or wherever it is, you make a lot of money. So yeah, men don't want to get within five miles of anything that feels like weakness or brokenness in us. Are you kidding me? Right? We are all deeply committed to, you know, faking our way through this thing because we fear exposure. This, this is a very interesting thing. <clears throat> women don't fear failure like men do. A woman can take a loss of a career, right, or a setback or a disappointment, and it doesn't seem to blow her out of the water. Women fear abandonment. Men fear failure. And so anything that might expose a weakness in us a flaw, anything that might indicate, you know, we're not as strong and amazing as, you know, we want the world to think we are. We don't want to get anywhere near that, right? Including, you know, getting in touch with any kind of brokenness or father wound inside of us. But we have to. We have to. If we're going to be whole and true and strong as men, how does society or the world or the media <clears throat> lend itself to this <clears throat> idea that we <clears throat> can't show weakness or brokenness? <clears throat> um, images of masculinity in the media are, are, are kind of crazy making because they're really, they go down these two really different tracks. You, know, you get the um, you know, Bruce Willis, uber tough, you know, die hard guy who's able to jump off buildings and take a couple of hits to the leg and still, you know, get the bad guys, right? You kind of get this incredible power strength, the super athletes, the guys who can do the triathlons and the Ironmans, you know, all of that. But then you also get in the media this, you know, that most dads are kind of idiots and you get the Homer Simpson and you get the caricatures of men as kind of bungling fools, right? And so there you have it. Every man wants to be seen as the hero. Every man fears he's the idiot, right? And so don't do anything that could expose yourself, right? That you are the idiot. You know, I don't want to be Homer Simpson, right? I want to be Superman. I want to be, you know, the amazing guy. And so we'll do everything we can to find a way to prove that we're amazing. And we'll do everything we can to hide any possible flaws in us, weakness, that kind of thing. And so, yeah, right? Like, I mean, society does not encourage this kind of, a, a kind of openness, a kind of honesty among men. And I mean, sadly, in the church, you know, this is, we don't encourage discussion of brokenness, right? We're scared of it. Uh, feels like it might be somehow diminishing uh, what God has done for us. Um, or we just don't know how to deal with it. You know, some guy opens up his brokenness and everybody, you know, freezes and goes, holy cow, this guy's a mess. You know, we, we got to get into a counselor when in fact every man you meet is broken inside. It, you know, you just don't get through this world without taking those wounds. All right, we are rolling and take it away. One of the quotes in, in Wild at Heart, which stuck with me, is the one that says, every man carries a wound. I've never met a man without one. And you referenced that a while ago. How big of an issue is this father wound epidemic, if you will? If you want to understand the power of the father wound and how pervasive this is, start with the symptoms, right? Like men are having a hard time being men. You, you, first off, you have all the addictions, right? The pornography, the gambling, you know, 
the alcohol, the cocaine, the food, all that, right? You, massive, massive. But then you also have all of the brokenness, um, the, the rise in suicides among men, depression, anxiety disorders, okay? But then you just have all that, you know, just kind of that army of great guys out there who feel like they're blowing it. You know, they, just, they don't feel good as dads. They don't feel like they know what to do with a marriage. They don't know how to handle a career. You know, and so you just, you just take all of this debris, right? I mean, what, what do you do with this evidence? How else do you explain that, right? Well, it all points back to one issue, right? It's, it's that deep, profound woundedness in the heart of men and how they mishandle it. Because men are famous for mishandling our own brokenness, right? Of course, I mean, it's a source of shame, so we hide it. You know, it's a source of pain, so we go medicate it with something, right? We, we do everything but go get it healed, right? And so the result is, you, you know, you just have something profoundly tragic in masculinity in the world. And that's why, you know, we'll take these different symptoms and we'll you know, run them up the flagpole on these talk shows and they'll say, well, you know, where are all the real dads, right? Or, you know, women get on these talk shows and they're like, where are the romantic men? Where are the guys who will really sweep you off your feet? And they, they take these different symptoms, right? But they never get back to, well, I can tell you what the crisis is. I can tell you what the cause of that is, right? You need to heal the heart of men. And then you'll get a man who knows how to love a woman. Then you'll get a man who knows how to be a dad. That, you know, let's deal with the brokenness, right? And then we can get guys back on their feet and, and, you know, and see them acting as men. And this is immensely helpful in the whole world of addictions, by the way. If you simply try and tinker with your addictions, right? I, I, gotta, I just got to stop. I got to, you know, I got I to gotta get off the drugs. I got to get off the alcohol. I got to quit the porn. Rarely does self-discipline work because those aren't the issue. You are medicating an internal pain. Deal with the internal pain. You won't need the medication anymore. <clears throat> How does a father wound affect boys and girls differently? This is a fascinating thing. Gender identity is bestowed by the father. Now, mom plays an enormous role in the life of boys and the life of girls, right? We learn from our mom unconditional love. Um, mothers bring mercy into a child's world, right? So when the little boy wants to jump off the roof, who's he ask? Well, he asks dad, right? But when he skins his knee, who's he go to? He goes to mom. Mom is tenderness, mom is mercy, mom is unconditional love, affirmation, I'll always be here for you. I found this really fascinating that um, universally on battlefields, men who are dying or profoundly wounded, do you know who they call out to? They call out to mom. But gender identity is bestowed by the father. Both little boys and little girls look to dad to answer their, their heart's deepest question. Now for boys, the question is, am I a man? Do I have what it takes, right? Am I strong? Am I powerful? Can I come through? And it's dad who says, you're amazing. I believe in you. The way you rode your bike, the way you, you know, got the A in the class, the way you drilled that, you know, basket at the end of the game, you have what it takes, okay? Little girls have a different question. They want to know, am I beautiful? Will someone fight for me? Will I ever be chosen? That's the feminine heart, okay? But she also looks to dad to answer that. And it's dad who says, oh, sweetheart, you're amazing. I love you. You're so pretty and I'm here for you. I'll protect you. I'll fight for you. And one day, you betcha, a great man is going to come along and see how amazing you are. You know, and if a little girl gets that kind of love and validation to the feminine heart, if she gets that from her dad, she's not going to sleep around in high school. It's the number one predictor of sexual promiscuity in teenage girls is the presence of a loving father who is answering her heart's deepest question, okay? Because she doesn't need to turn to boys to go get that. So the father wound expresses itself in different ways in boys and girls, right? Um, you know, men are wounded in the place of validation of I don't have what it takes, I'm not loved, I never will be, right? And, and little girls wounded in the in the 
and little girls are wounded in the place in their feminine heart that you're not worth fighting for. You're not even worth knowing. No one will ever choose you. Two kinds of woundedness, it both comes usually through the Father. Okay. We're good? Yeah, keep going. Okay. <clears throat> What are the long-term effects? Well, you know what? Let me back up. I think you've, you've covered that. In what way does the father wound lead men to anger? It seems like there are a lot of angry men. Mm -hmm. Specifically, mm -hmm. how does that mm -hmm. lead to anger? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, one of the things that's really important to understand about boys and then about men, we want to be powerful. The, the whole Spider-Man... Jedi Knights, I want to be Batman, I want to be a superhero. You know, they wear the pajamas and the capes and little guys, you know, they, they want to be amazing. They want to be strong. And that's because a man bears the image of God in his strength. We portray to the world the strength of God. God will come through. Man will come through. Okay, and so when a father wound is taken in this place of, you know, I don't know that I'm a man, I'm unsure about that, this anger rises up in men. We know that we're meant to come through, we don't know that we can, and we are furious at the world for asking us to be something that we don't know that we are. And so in a marriage, you know, the wife's requiring some things of her husband, and Good for her, by the way. She does need to require some things of her husband. But if he doesn't feel like he's got what it takes to come through for her, he'll be angry at her, right, for demanding that of him, okay? Or at work, you know, and, and, and the whole work world for men can be a very emasculating experience. You know, he doesn't get to make decisions. He's like, yes, sir. He's got to get in line, take orders, that kind of thing. And if he doesn't, again, have these inner issues resolved, He's going to be one angry man at work, right? And then feeling powerless and, you know, raising kids. That It's the whole strength, powerless thing. If a man feels strong and powerful, he'll come through for you, right? He'll take risks. What, what is that quality? What is that quality in men that caused those firemen to run up the stairs in the World Trade Center when everybody else were running down? What is that, that courage, that bravery, that guy knows he's got what it takes, right? And then he'll offer it for you. But if he doesn't know he has what it takes, if he's carrying around this broken heart, this deep wound, he's kind of, going to kind of be angry at everything, including himself. So how is it that the father wound then leads to the issue of rejection, feelings of rejection or abandonment? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, starting with that first basic need of a boy, do you love me? Do you delight in me, Dad? You know, are you proud of me? Knowing that your dad is there for you and that he will never leave you and never forsake you, right? Establishes a confidence, again, in a boy's heart that he's able to move into a man's world. If that gets wounded, he is going to fear rejection and abandonment for the rest of his life. And so, you, you know, in very severe cases, you get, you know, emotional attachment disorders, right? And, and they can't commit to a relationship and they can't experience love and like deep withdrawal, deep hiding. In, in less severe, you'll just get guys who are fairly checked out, don't want to commit to a relationship, you know, don't really want to invest in friendships with men. You know, you go, why, why do men isolate? What, what's with the isolation thing? Most guys don't have friends. Right? And, and when they do get in social settings, it stays pretty surface level. Well, they're afraid of exposure. They're afraid of rejection. Everyone's going to do to me what dad did to me is the deep fear, right? So if it's criticism, then he's hypersensitive to criticism, right? And he, he can't take just a simple instruction from his boss. Hey, Hal, you know, you kind of blew it on that project. Can you, can you get that fixed for me? And, you know, he, he feels all this criticism. Well, that's the father wound, right? If, if it was abandonment, then he's going to fear abandonment, right? It, or if it's betrayal, like as in many divorce scenarios, the wound is a betrayal wound in the man. He's going to fear betrayal in friendships. He's going to fear betrayal from his wife, right? And so he's going to insulate himself emotionally. How does the father wound shape a man's view of God? 
I noticed for years, uh, well, first, let me tell you a little bit about my story. So I'm the only son in my family. I have two older sisters. So when I was young, I was kind of the apple of my dad's eye. My dad loved to fish. My sisters wanted to go. My dad loved to fish. My sisters didn't want to go fishing. So I loved it. I got dad. I got dad on weekends. I got to play with dad. And, and then my dad got taken out through a series of just job losses. I, I think some real disappointments in his own life not dealing with his own woundedness, he, he fell to drinking. And as happens with some men, I mean, it just grabbed him like a riptide and took him out to sea, and he was gone. So deep abandonment wounds. Right at the time in the boy's life, when you're shifting from the boyhood years into the teenage years, and you need to know that you've got what it takes, right? I mean, I my dad was gone, checked out, absent. And so... <clears throat> What was the question you asked? <laughs> How does the father wound shape a boy or man? Yeah, view of God. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so, um, uh, so he was gone physically, emotionally, spiritually. My dad was gone. Now, um, late in my teenage years, I developed a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, and it was the single most wonderful, phenomenal event life-changing event in, in, in my story. I mean, it's a total turnaround for me. And, and, um, and I began my faith journey with God. I began to notice, though, in my 20s that um, I could relate to Jesus. I wasn't really big on this God as Father thing. And I would hear guys talk about, oh, my Father God, or you know, they'd even pray things like, Abba, Father. And I'm like, no thanks. Like, that's kind of weird. You know, I'm not really interested in this father thing. And, well, guess what, right? The, you know, my experience of a father who left and, and left me alone to figure life out translated directly into my experience of God as father, thinking, ah, he's distant, he's not available, he's probably going to check out. I'm, I'm still pretty much on my own to figure life out, even though there's God. Right? I'm still, it's still pretty much up to me. And you'll find that in many men of faith. They may have a deep and genuine faith in God. They may study their scriptures and attend church regularly, but they're still living with this profound conviction inside that life is up to me. Right? That, you know, my career, it's up to me. Figuring these kids out, this marriage, you know, it's up to me. Right? Making enough to get the bills paid, it's all up to me. Right? Even men of deep faith, still have that disconnect that they're not the beloved son. They don't have a father who delights in them, right, that loves all over them, that believes in them. And so your experience with your father growing up profoundly influences your kind of unspoken, almost subconscious assumptions about what God as father is like. Here's the question of the day. What problem have you had as a dad and how did you overcome it? Leave a comment and let us know because we'd love to hear from you. And it may just help another dad. Along those same lines, in, in men understanding that they are a beloved child of God, a beloved son of God, and the identity that comes mm -hmm. along with that, mm -hmm. why is it that men, why is it so difficult for men to get that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, <clears throat> you cannot appreciate what it means to be a son of God. You cannot appreciate how much your father loves you. You can't begin to kind of rest in, I'm a, I'm a son, I'm a beloved son, until you deal with the father wound. Because that part of your heart is the receptor of love. That part of your heart is the receptor of blessing and validation, and that part of your heart shut down. Like, I mean, we lock that door, we throw away the key, and guys will walk away from that for 60 years and never open that room up again. And then they go, I don't understand why I feel so distant from God or from my wife or my kids. See, you cannot shut your heart down and expect to experience any kind of relational joy anywhere in your life, okay, let alone with God. And so in order for us to be able to experience the love of God, fathering of God, a sense of being a son, you, you first actually have to go back into the wound. you got to open that broken heart up to the love of God. Open that brokenness up to the healing 
ministry of Jesus. And then, yeah, as that begins to get cleaned out and there's forgiveness and there's healing, right? Your heart starts to come alive again. And I mean, oh yeah, a whole world opens up for you of joy and anticipation and hope and happiness, all because you begin to realize, wow, I, I am a son. I've actually always been a son. I've always had a father who loves me. I just didn't know it. Couldn't experience it because of the, the brokenness inside. So I lived in denial, even, even after understanding, yes. and knowing that I had this. Yes. I lived in denial for a couple of more years. Yes. Why is it that men do that, even in understanding maybe this concept of a father? And why do mm. we still deny it? Mm. Mm. Only once we have some assurance that this brokenness, try again, only once that we have some kind of assurance that this brokenness in us can actually be fixed, right? That we can actually get some relief, that, that genuine healing and restoration could actually take place for us, only then really is a man willing to go here and admit it. I mean, we'll admit it intellectually, but here's the important thing to understand. <clears throat> Let me try this whole thing again. Sure. <clears throat> Many men will admit uh, a father wound. They'll admit something wasn't right back in their childhood. They'll even be able to name the abuse or the abandonment or the violence or the rejection. You know, um, but intellectually understanding that you have a father wound or that you might have a father wound is not the same thing as healing and restoration, okay? Understanding is not healing. Clarity is not restoration, okay? They can lead to healing and restoration, but it's only once we're willing to go into that, usually with the help of, of, of a caring person, a friend, a brother, a pastor, a counselor, you know, someone to kind of help us walk through this wound. And until a guy is convinced that restoration's available, well, why would he go here? I mean, you want me to, you want me to do what? You want me to open this pain up again in my life? You want me to go back into all that mess? Why? Right? They've got to see in the context of other men's lives, they've got to see, whoa, healing's available. Restoration might even be available for me. Now I'm willing, like, sign me up. You know, if they can see that, if they can be invited into, we don't want to just expose this. We don't want you to just kind of have 20 more years of, you know, fresh misery, right? We have an offer for you, right? Jesus's primary work in the world of men is I want to heal that broken heart. I want to heal that wound. I want to tell you who you are as a man. I want to bring you the validation you didn't get. It, it, it's, the, it's the best news in the world. It literally is the gospel. It is great news. And guys need to know that in order to be willing to go there. You got to understand the dynamic of posing in order to understand the dynamic of men and the fellowship of men and men's friendships, whether it's the bar scene or it's the men's retreat at church, okay? Same, same dynamic, right? Guys primarily are faking it, okay? Scared to death to be known, scared to death to, you know, to unzip and show the world who they really are because what do they think is going to happen? Exactly what happened before with dad, right? Criticism, ridicule, violence, rejection, abandonment. You know, we are just terrified that if you really see me, if you see me, you're going to laugh, you're going to leave, right? You're going to be appalled. And so guys are like, ah, I'm going to fake it, you know? So if you're a funny guy, you know, you kind of play the funny guy. Or if you're the serious spiritual guy, you just kind of play the serious spiritual guy. And you don't get anything like real brotherhood. You don't get anything like genuine fellowship while all this posing is going on, right? And so the journey towards an authentic masculinity and the journey towards authentic brotherhood involves both a willingness to quit faking it, right? To, to just go, look, I'm done with the poser. I'm sick of that guy, right? It's the false self 
just a mask I put onto the world and I'm just sick of it. I'm done with that life. I don't want to be that guy anymore. Setting that stuff down and also beginning to experience some genuine healing of the inner brokenness, right? That opens up this phenomenal world of friendship and connection and band of brothers that guys crave and, and is available. And it's available in, in Christianity like it's available nowhere else. One of the greatest things that we can tell single moms especially, or moms where the dad's kind of checked out, physically present, but in every other way absent, is you don't have to be dad. You can't be dad. Okay, you get to be mom, right? But that little boy or that little girl needs the father influence, and that can come from uncles and coaches and teachers and pastors and mentors and youth leaders. Like You can find the kind of male influence that you need for your child's life, like Boy Scouts and sports and all that stuff, okay? It's available. It really is. There's a lot of good men out there that are offering fathering experiences to children who are not their own, right? Through clubs and classes and just in the neighborhood, okay? Family situations. Maybe grandpa can step in, right, and offer what dad didn't offer. But to put that pressure on mom, right, is a crushing load. It's enough to be mom. Like mom is a full-time job. Mom is all she's got. And if she feels like she's got to be both mom and dad, I mean, it just, it just becomes brittle. It's exhausting. It can't be done, right? And so the first big kind of relief is you don't have to. You, you don't have to be mom and dad, okay? But you do need to get a dad influence into the lives of your children, okay? And you pray for it. You look for it, you know? Where's that, where's that opportunity, whether through the local soccer club or you know, some class at church or some, some situation, a summer camp kind of a thing where, you know, some fathering can take place in the lives of your kids and you don't have to try and offer that yourself. Why is it that a mom can't give a boy <clears throat> that you have what it takes? This is one of the great mysteries of the masculine journey and one of the great secrets is that masculinity is bestowed by masculinity. It cannot come from any other source. A boy cannot learn he's a man from the troop of boys, okay? Can't learn it from other boys. He can't learn it from a woman. He can only get it from a masculine source. And this is actually one of the great secrets to setting men free from pornography. Because pornography is not about sex. Pornography is about validation, right? That woman makes you feel like a man. Okay, it's really a, a deeply validated man who knows who he is as a man is not fooled by the siren. Okay, but the man who's looking for some mercy and some affirmation and some love and some validation, you know, he's going to be a sucker for that stuff. Okay, so th this is the great secret. Masculinity can only be bestowed by masculinity. And this is again why, and the reason why, is that you have a father as the center of the universe and his relationship with the Son in the Trinity, right? With the Holy Spirit. That relationship's the deepest relationship in all creation. Okay, the Father bestows identity, right? Jesus is baptized in the Jordan. He comes up out of the water. And in one of the few instances in all of the Bible, God speaks out loud so everybody can hear. And he says two things. He says, I am so proud of you, Jesus, and I love you. This is my beloved son, right? In him, I am so pleased. That's the core need. There it is right there. Love and validation from a masculine voice. Okay, And if we don't get it from the father, can't get it from the mother, right? Can't get it from girls, right? Broken boys often chase after the girls to try and you know, make them feel like a man and, you know, and all that stuff, the loud cars and, the, you know, the music and the sports and the crazy things that young men do, you know, it's all looking for validation. They're looking for the voice of a father to speak into their life. I see you. You're amazing. I love you and you have what it takes. The idea of a generational curse. 
Can, can you explain that? Can you give me an idea of, of maybe why men don't get that? Why there's not a connection there? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, this is a fascinating thing. If you'll notice, certain kinds of brokenness, certain kinds of addictions or bondages seem to flow down through family lines. You'll find in one family line it's divorce. And, and you'll look back and go, wow, great-grandfathers and and great uncles, and, and then fathers, and cousins, and then it, it's like, what's with divorce in this family line? But in another family line, it's not that at all. It's alcohol, right? And it seems like, wow, yeah, you know, my great uncle was an alcoholic, and then my cousin was, and now I am, and you kind of see this thing working its way. Sometimes it's sexual issues, and you see that passed down through family lines. This is a spiritual principle given to us in Scripture. The sins of the fathers being passed down generation to generation, right? And, and this is a very helpful thing to understand, that quite often what you feel is just your mess, your struggles, is actually something that kind of got passed down through a family line. And therefore, you can actually get out from under it. It's not just you. It's a really great thing to know, you know, this particular sexual issue or my thing with alcohol or money or even things like failure or rejection get passed down through the sins of the Father. And the power of Christianity and the power of the cross to break those things is, is just phenomenal. That you can come out from under that whole legacy of sexual sin. You can come out from under that whole legacy of debt or failure, or, or rejection, or betrayal, or whatever it is that's kind of been dogging your heels for years, through the work of Jesus Christ, you can actually break with the family line and come out from under that stuff and to experience a, a greater freedom. And this is also a phenomenal gift you give to your kids. When you draw the line in the sand and you say, that generational stuff does not pass me, that, is, that ends here, because of my relationship with Christ, because of what he has done for me through his cross, through the power of his resurrection, and his authority now given to him, that's over here. Like, I end that with the help of Christ, through the work of Christ. What a gift that you are giving to your children, your grandchildren, their children, to, to stop the legacy here. I mean, you're a hero. So how is it that a father wound, as it, as it pertains to the generational curse, how, how is that affected or impacted? My grandfather was an alcoholic. And my dad used to have to go and find him in the local small town bars and bring him home at night when he was a boy. And, and then my dad became an alcoholic, you see. And I had to help my dad through some of his episodes. And were it not for the presence of Jesus Christ in my life, I would be too. I mean, I'm set up for that. This stuff gets passed down generation to generation. And what a breakthrough for me to realize, wait a second, wait a second. My dad was wounded. My granddad was wounded, okay? They carried an unresolved father wound themselves, right? And, and so this thing just gets passed on down through the line here. You can't, you cannot give what you do not have. You can't, I remember uh, one of my clients once telling me that he was begging his dad, dad, I just need you to tell me you love me and, and that you're proud of me. And his dad literally looks at him and says, I can't. Nobody ever did that for me. Like you, it's hard to it's hard to give what you didn't get, right? And so, to understand, your dad was wounded, your granddad was wounded. the The world of men, right, has taken a lot of hits here since the fall of Adam. Okay, and so you've got broken men raising broken men. You've got broken fathers, right, and they end up raising broken sons. You talked a little bit about porn a while ago and, and just uh, the influence a father has on his son. How is a boy's view of sex mm -hmm. shaped by his dad? Mm -hmm. um, I just had a wonderful experience. My oldest son just got married. 
And, and I, I had the wonderful opportunity to sit him down before his honeymoon and talk to him about a woman, about her body, his body, about sexuality, about what it looks like to love a woman. Who gets this? Like, I didn't get that from my dad. He didn't get that from his dad. You know, but to have a father show you the proper place of sexuality in your life, I mean, this is all, again, deeply linked to the father wound. Um, collect my thoughts here. <clears throat> Uh, yeah, okay. Most of the sexual struggles of men have some tie or connection to their father wound. If the father wound was abandonment and rejection, well, guess what? He's trying to heal that. He's trying to get some ease there, some ministry to that by the love and the affection of a woman, right? He's going to, he's taking all that um, pain of rejection and abandonment to the woman, okay? Or, you know, um, if he learned from his father, you don't have what it takes. You are not a man. And then you get some woman that comes along and says, I think you're amazing. I mean, he's going to be in bed with her in about 30 minutes, okay? To have an unvalidated man, right? And, and he thinks he can get validation from the woman. So, so many of our sexual struggles are actually directly related to the father one. And so the opposite is also true. You get a father who's teaching his son He's loved. He's got what it takes. You've got a father who's teaching his son about sexuality and what it means to be a noble and good man. Huh. I mean, that guy, that guy is actually set up for a wonderful sexual relationship with his wife when that day comes, right? Because he's good inside, right? He's good and he's whole and he knows that a man doesn't go to a woman to get strength. A man goes to a woman offer strength. And then she flourishes in that, he flourishes in that, and the intimacy within the marriage can be a wonderful thing. Two more. A follow-up to that. Yeah. One. How is it that a father's um, influence a girl's view of sex? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, every little girl's question is, do you see me Am I beautiful? Do you delight in me? Am I worth fighting for? You know, will I be chosen? And, and when her daddy tells her a thousand times over her growing up years, you are, sweetheart. And they go on the date nights and he leaves little cards for her when he goes on a trip and he brings her flowers for Valentine's Day, even though she doesn't have a boyfriend, right? He's, he's noticing. He's there for her birthday and, and those kind of things. That little girl, Right? She's good inside, and she doesn't need to turn to boys to make her feel loved. Right, She can save herself sexually for the, for the marriage right? because she's good inside. The opposite's true. You get a little girl that's broken, doesn't know she's loved, doesn't know that you know, she's beautiful and that she will be chosen. She will give herself right, in order to try and get that father love, try and get that assurance that she didn't get growing up, right? So it's a, it's a double-edged sword. The power of the father to cripple is equal to the power of the father to bless. And you get a dad who's blessing his daughter, right? She's going to know what kind of man to look for. She's going to know what to hold out for in a man. She's not going to settle for some broken poser, right? She's going to wait for a good man who's going to love her well. Last one here, and then what we'll do is, you want to quick, take a quick break, Jason? One last one. What's the best advice that you would give fathers? Are we ready, Jason? We're rolling. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and I can even shape it another way. If you had a friend that was going to be a father for the first time, mm -hmm. what, what advice would you give him? Mm -hmm. The power of your love given freely to your children, to your son or your daughter, is more than you believe it is. You, you got to kind of hold on to that because you don't feel powerful. And becoming a dad, and it's always frontier. You know, you get the baby thing figured out, and then they become little kids. And you get the little kids thing figured out, and they become teenagers. And you begin to kind of get the teenage thing worked out, and they go off, 
right, to school or marriage or career. It, 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 um, being a father is always frontier. That's okay. Here's what you need to know. The power of your love in their life is immeasurable. You, you are the most powerful figure in the world in their lives. Offer your love freely. Offer it openly. Offer it often. Because here's the great promise. Um, love covers a multitude of sins. It's not that we're going to get this thing perfect. Okay? I've wounded my sons. I've blown it. I think I've been a great dad, but I've also messed up, okay? They know I love them. They know that in the core of their being. And when a, when a boy or a girl knows that, it, it, it can cover over some of the other mistakes we make. Tell them you love them often. Awesome. Okay. Open mic time. Do you want to do just a quick break? Or do you have... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got, I got one thing. Okay. I got what we got to go back awesome. to. Yep. Perfect. I can start a new clip. <clears throat> okay. One of the most important things that men watching this can understand is that Jesus is able to heal your wound. He is able to heal your brokenness. He's really, really good at it. And when he steps into the scene for his public ministry in Luke chapter 4, he could have quoted from a thousand different verses in the Old Testament about the, you know, sacrificial lamb or, or the mighty king. Or, and, and you know what he chooses? He chooses Isaiah 61. I have come to heal your broken heart and set you free. I want to restore you as a man and I want to set you free. And, and the promise of that is for you. It's for you. It's not just for other guys, okay? So you begin to open up your broken heart to Jesus and you invite him into that woundedness, okay? You say, come into my broken heart and make that promise real for me. I need you to heal my woundedness. I want you to set my heart free. He'll do it. Awesome. Hey, before you go, remember to check out the Father Effect Show where I interview fascinating, influential, and sometimes ordinary people with extraordinary stories about how to be a better dad, about how they found healing and hope from their own relationship with their fathers. Remember, your life is your legacy, and what you do and say every day is impacting your family and the generations to come. See you next time on The Father Effect. Mm -hmm.